All right, we're rolling here. All right, super fired up. I got my man, Chad Teague. Yeah, I think this is your, well, we did a part one and a part two because I spent so much damn time with you the first time I came out with my staff when I was back at Akron. Um, but obviously really excited to, to get back and, and do this since I'm not in the same region anymore. I guess the same area. So I know we got a lot to catch up on and you've been doing a lot of new things. So I'm, I'm fired up to, to hear about, but um, so I don't talk a bunch. Why don't you just kind of tell people what you're doing now, what's new with Code Cairo, um, obviously you're working into the NFL a little bit now, which is freaking awesome. I'm super excited to hear about that as well. And, um, kind of talk about how you and I know each other and, and we can kind of just go through all that. Sweet. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me again. Uh, this is a Skype version this time. You're not that far away from me. I still have to make a trip up there, see yeah. the new facility out. Um, but yeah, so, uh, a lot of things have changed here. We have, um, at Code Cairo. Uh, we have a new associate doc here, Dr. Ryan, um, and he's been he's been here since January, and uh, he's helping really kind of take over uh, our excess uh, the load of patients that are you know coming in and kind of help help and fill in. Um, we've also started a nutrition program here, so we hired a nutritionist. Um, really? Yeah. So she has her own office. Uh, in here as well, we have another spare room that we created an office for her where she is, uh, she's been about, I think she's about three weeks in now. So that's going really well. Um, other than that, uh, we have actually started, yeah, you you were asking about the athletes we we're working on. Um, we started getting in with the Browns a little bit. Uh, we are currently seeing about 10 of them, uh, kind of between their, uh, you know, since they got back from since when camp started, so OTAs back in summer, that's where it really started. Um, other than that, uh, we've what else you got? Yeah, I mean, I guess just so people kind of know who they're listening to, where you wanted to go. Have, you're so much more than like a, a chiropractor, so I don't even like to say like, oh, this is my buddy Chad Tate, the chiropractor. What do you like? Can you just kind of tell, just so the people listening before we get into this know, yeah. like what what do you do? Like what are you? What would you? How do you kind of? What box do you define yourself to be put in? I guess. Okay. Uh, well, I use chiropractic school to get me the platform that I have now, which is a large scope of practice where I can do a lot of things. Um, from that, I've again since starting back to uh, Dr. Mendel and uh, at Mount Union. Which funny story I haven't told you yet. His son just came and started shadowing me, uh, so it's really? coming full circle now. So, um, but anyway, so way back in the day when we first met at Mount Union, kind of getting into that exercise physiology and just like analyzing biomechanics was was kind of very interesting to me uh, from a, from a young age. So, taking that into chiropractic school is what changed my path when I was there. So when you're in school, you kind of pick and choose what path you want to go down and then really specialize or hone in on what, what you want. Um, and biomechanics for me was huge. So, uh, and I knew there's not a ton of chiropractors out there that really dive into that. They're, they're scattered across the country. Um, and a lot of them are working with, you know, the professional sports teams and the collegiate sports teams like you guys have. So, um, Finding and creating something along those along those lines was really my main goal. Um, and what we do here specifically is uh, we, we do a functional movement screen, uh, a little step up or different route of that. Everyone, know, I think you guys all know what that is. And most people, your listeners know what that is. So we do the SFMA, so more on the clinical side um, and kind of break that down on our patient evaluations. And that's from NFL players to our, you know, middle school teacher that, you know, likes to run marathons, you know, that like across the board, we do those. And that really helps us diagnose, you know, what the problem is, whether it's, you know, a mobility issue, a stability issue, uh, you know, they have a previous injury that they might not know that it really created a range of motion problem, you know, 20 years ago, and they've just never done anything about it. So that's, that's the approach we take, and then we use our scope of practice to be able to treat and diagnose those injuries. So um, we do a wide spectrum of, you know, the soft tissue aspect, uh, 
you know, a lot of the chiropractic treatments we do. Uh, so ART, active release technique, uh, dry needling, um, Graston, cupping, whatever we need to do to get the job done, flexion, distraction. And then our biggest, most important part of our practice is getting people moving in our gym and teaching them how to move so these injuries don't come back. And that's yeah. and that, again, can be your athletes to, again, that, that middle school marathon runner teacher. Yeah. So I was thinking – yesterday before we when i was writing these questions and i'm like you know i want to i always think about like what commonalities and why i why i keep people in my corner that i keep and i started thinking about just your path and what makes you so special or different or different from people and i think it's that you know like i think about you know a surgeon always wants to perform surgery right or or whatever typically our scope of practice is like we 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 absorb this crazy bias towards only seeing the body or anything in that one avenue and I think one thing that you've done an absolutely spectacular job of is, yes, you're a code, you know, you're a, you're a quote unquote chiropractor, but like, you know, typically a chiropractor wants to just crack, you know, and fix and do those things. But you, you, you have, you have made your box so much bigger and you look at things in such a unique perspective. What do you think gave you that? Like what, what, cause you, I mean, it's, like I said, it's just so much different, but coming from your background or, or, or what allows you to be so open-minded and see things with such a unbiased perspective as you look at the human body? Um, I would have to say, that's a really good question. Um, I think I've, I've kind of taken, you know, my path has not been straight the entire time right. I'm going to school. I didn't know I could really dive into this, you know, I'm, uh, you know, biomechanics portion of, of chiropractic and, and, you know, just, biomechanics in general and trying to fix people's movement and uh you know f being in that that realm you know going into like actually post-surgery post-surgery was where it really started you know clicking for me and taking my my shoulder injury and kind of you know finding why i was you know pre why i had to have surgery and then you know post why were these therapists you know trying to rehab me back and what what their main goal was um, so that's what stirred it up in the beginning. Uh, and then seeing people move poorly and then constantly staying injured and not getting anything accomplished was, is, you know, that's how I created my business plan. And, um, on, on our, our, the whole basis behind our office here is just finding what you're doing to fix that, you know, finding what you're doing wrong in your day to day life whether you're an athlete or not, and then changing that, that movement pattern or changing, you know, how you, you reach and grab your mug out of your, out of your cabinet, just kind of reorganizing your body and, and teaching it. And that's as simple, you know, as simple as it is. So. What do you think? Cause I mean, I guess this is just something that I've continued to think about as I would say when I first really got into biomechanics, I really thought that everybody needed to move a certain way. I, I think as I've gotten deeper into it, I certainly believe now that certain people have anatomical deficiencies or just biomechanical movement patterns of the solutions they've created. And I guess, I, I guess this is a tough question. To ask, I guess, but you know, what, is, what is the balance of, of not correcting a solution? That's not, Oh, I guess you, you create the problem. Like the athletes fine. They, they've, they've made this solution to their movement problem. It's not putting them at risk. They don't operate under pain, but then regardless, we just want to fix it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like what do you have a, do you have a barometer there of, as far as this guy comes to me, he doesn't have pain. He moves kind of, you know, kind of weird, but he's, he's efficient. He's fast. He's powerful. He's explosive and he doesn't have pain. He's not injured. So why would I fix it? That's a very good point. And, um, I, you, you go a little bit backtrack to the anatomical variant. So I, I really like diving into that. And that's what, you know, kind of keeps my, my brain turning every day is taking every person individually because everyone's different. You know, if you have, if you have the acetabulum of, you know, this guy versus this guy, they're going to be different. Some, some are pointing more forward, some are more down and out. Some are, you know, it just depends on where their body, you know, has their, their variants, I, I guess is the best way to put it. But, um, so, so no, you might not be able to get someone to a perfect position, but you want to guide them back to as close to that as possible through your, your knowledge on what, you know, your opinion on, on biomechanics is. Um, but, uh, then you went into, uh, what was the next point you were talking about? 
just like, and I mean, I guess now you said that even makes me think about this. Like it's, I guess what I've realized, it comes down to concepts. Right. And I think the, the most, I saw this graphic uh, the other day, or I think Cam sent me, Cam Josh sent me this graphic. It's a top 10 sprinters in the world. And it's just, it's a shadow of each of them. And it's their first step off the block. And not one of them is, I mean, they all have conceptual similarities. Yeah. But if you look at the details, every single one of the 10 has a different start out of the blocks, a different first step out of the blocks. But all 10 of them are the top 10 fastest people in the world. So it's like we have to operate under these, under these assumptions of like concepts, not details, right? But yep. I guess coaches get so lost in the fact that like, uh, oh, it's got to look this way. Every athlete needs Perfect. to move like this. Every and so I guess, do you have a, do you have a system when you look at athletes and say, okay, this is not what I would consider ideal, but conceptually it checks the boxes and it's okay. Yeah, no, and and that's kind of back to like the SFMA for us. Seeing that's our barometer. That's what kind of gauges. You know, this is an anomaly. That's that's not normal. Um, right. Oh, and, and that kind of gauges what we think the direction we should go with that person. But like you're saying with um, a patient that is not injured or, you know, is extremely fast or extremely quick and they, they don't have any injuries, you know, in your realm and as a strength coach, getting these high school athletes, they might have never been injured, but they're still growing. They're still gaining a lot of mass. You're putting a lot of mass on them and my opinion is that we you should again try to guide them along and get them in that path as close as possible obviously there's still variants but they might not have had an injury yet because obviously it's just it could be luck but um you know i we've talked about this probably 30 times but rg3 you know he moves extremely fast he is extremely athletic has crazy numbers but no one checked out his boxes with his inefficiencies on how he moved. And, yeah. you know, you can be an extremely elite, you can be an extreme elite athlete, you know, top of the level. But if you move poorly in practice, if you move poorly in the weight room, you're going to get injured at some point. And if you do get injured, it's probably going to be harder to come back from that injury. So if yeah. you can kind of guide people in that direction and get them, you know, it all starts from the foot we've talked about and, and getting that, you know, that initial uh, small foot mechanic set up and teaching them how to break down, how to decelerate, how to, you know, you talk a lot about shin angles, which I love that, that really kind of opened my mind even more to, you know, learning how to incorporate that small foot into a shin angle and generate that force output. Um, so trying to get them as close, like I said, this is the, this is the, um, you know, the, the straight and narrow path, but you know, try to get them from out here and bring them close to that as possible. And there's going to be some, uh, you know, some curves along the way, but you know, that's like the best, the best route. I, I guess where I get frustrated sometimes with all this stuff is it's, it's, I mean, I, I guess when I look at my career, right, I've had guys that are, are weak in general, have terrible hamstring strength, um, you know, can't do any freaking, can't do any a, a Nordic hamstring, can RDL 175, and they'll they'll go through an entire year and be healthy. Yeah. And then you'll have you'll have you on the other end, you'll have a guy that does everything the right way, has strong ass hamstrings, has no deficiencies, and he'll go and he'll tweak his hamstring. Like it's not a matter of if, like it's just it's gonna happen. Yeah. And we yeah. can't we can't prevent everything. Yep. Um, and there's like there's commonalities, right? But my 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 next question is then. Like we know more about injuries than we've ever known before, right? We, we, we have GPS, we have player load, we have monitoring, we know more about biomechanics, we have more tools, we have more knowledge, we have more access to knowledge than we've ever had, and injuries are the highest they've ever been. And they keep on growing. Why and how in the hell are we going to fix it? That is going to be a, an, a constant evolution, in my opinion. Um, we have all this information, we have all this data, we have – you know, more strength coaches than ever in gyms. We have more athletic trainers. We have all of the resources possible. And I think that's kind of a double-edged sword. We're making these athletes so fast and, you know, so powerful that a lot of times, you know, they didn't have this technology back, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, 
and and just like a full spectrum of of, of yeah. all teams, like every single college, collegiate, Division one school, a lot of Division two, and and basically most of the Division three schools as well. And now you're you're constantly adding all of these you know these athletes into the to real programs, and they're getting really strong, really fast. And I, that's my only thought process that I that I can come up with because the technology is getting better on the healing side, but we're also getting these athletes so fast that we, we just can't keep up with the, the hamstring injuries are just insane. They're getting so fast that hamstrings and meniscus, especially in the, the, you know, these shorter slot slot backs, these slot receivers, they're getting so fast at the routes and they're, they're ace, uh, accelerating, decelerating at such a rate that their, their body isn't keeping up with it. And yeah. it's insane. I've had, I had one of our, um, one of our players, uh, there was a quarterback that played against Mount Union. He was on the Browns this, this year in the OTAs, and he moves so fast. He's a shorter guy, but he would just he, he just over reps after reps after reps, and then just bam, he just blew his hamstring. So, yeah, I mean, and they're, they're player loads, and that's even it's a you're right, it's a double edged sword because we sit there and we look at what, you know we've been messing around with all of our GPS stuff this year for the first time in my career. I've had GPS this whole year, and you sit there and you look at like you're more explosive, powerful guys. Their player load is so much higher than everybody else's because of the rate they're accelerating, and decelerating. But so that like that that's where and we've had this conversation before. How like I people say that you can't be too strong. I don't. I'm not ready to sit here and say that you can be. But I'm not ready to sit here and say that you can't be. Like there's there's got to be a point in time that like once we get to that level of what we consider strong enough. I mean, isn't that enough? Yeah. Is if if a guy can squat 500 pounds ass to grass with perfect technique. If, wow. if we get him to 550, is that going to make him going. a better football player? Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, what, what? That's where you're, you, you brought a guy in to talk about that uh, baseball guy. And I remember that, that conversation that it, like yeah. opened my eyes even more again to, um, he was, he was working with, I want to say track athletes. And yeah, it was, it was Todd Hammer, wasn't it? From uh, RMU at the time. Gosh, we were upstairs in Akron at the, yeah. at the that was an awesome, uh, you know, presentation and just taking normals and kind of saying like, hey, if you're if you're a linebacker and you can bench this, you can squat this and deadlift this or whatever, power clean, whatever you're doing, why try to continue going up? Try to find take that person, find their weaknesses and take a little bit of area out of that strength and maybe work on their agility, maybe work on their coordination, uh, their midline stabilization, just things like that. So um no that's a that's a really really good point and that, and and again constant evolution of of the direction of injuries and technology yeah i mean i'm thinking about dick hartzell i mean you remember for the first like four years of my career dick hartzell would tell me you know stop stop lifting guys stop back sweating guys just do all band work and i thought the guy was like a coop for a minute about that stuff you know like all the all the all the floss and all the the band stretching i love that but when he would talk about his programming i was like okay dude all right yeah. and I, I swear i mean I, I get to the point where i'm getting older i i see more value into that argument at least yeah. of of yeah Not i mean I, completely, it, but like yeah i mean it's 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 just at least something where like if someone came and talked to me about it now i'd be like okay i guess i i can understand that cuz i i think I think I agree with you. I don't, I don't know that I'm ready to completely agree, but I think I agree that while we are creating the biggest, strongest, fastest athletes we've ever created before, we're also forcing them into positions and, and amount of force productions that I don't know that bodies are meant to be able to sustainably withhold over and over and over and over and over again. And so you just got to keep on searching for the balance, I guess. I mean, Crazy. and I'm and sure just, everybody, just, everybody wants to know what it is, but I don't know. Like, I don't, I just don't know. Just a, it's a constant learning curve. Did that, did his programming throw you off more or when he would jump into the uh, split? What was, what was more? <laughs> equal. Equal. Equal, on those. Equal, equal, equal catching me off guard. Um, all right. Well, we, we kind of went down that rabbit hole a little bit here. So, yeah. Let's let's go back into more like you know more relative things here as far as actually things we do know. Um, what when you when you are looking at these Browns players and you're looking at athletes and I mean I've I've sent you a bunch of my athletes in the past when I was at Akron. What are some commonalities, especially I guess we specifically keep it to football. What are what are some of those common checkpoints that you look through and you're like, 
as a, as a college football transition coach, these are things that are commonalities within football players. These are the issues. These are things I see a lot of, and these are things that you need to be really weary of with, with your athletes. Uh, so I would say the number one thing we initially do again, like I said before is SFMA most common thing we talked about it a ton that I see is lack of, um, activation of their arch. Yeah. Number one, we see a ton of lower extremity injuries with those guys from like tweaks, which is again, week to week, we see tweak after tweak after tweak. I'm constantly yep. trying to like, just kind of put a bandaid on, work a little more, put a bandaid on it, work a little more and just kind of p- push them in that direction of, um, better biomechanics. And, because of the the small foot, I think that a lot of these uh, lower extremity in- issues arise. You know, the hamstring issues, the hip issues, the knee issues, um, and and obviously I'm treating and focusing on those. But my my main goal is down back down to the foot. Always constantly focusing and teaching them how to squeeze their foot so that knee is in a more stable plane and not coming into that valgus position when they're again coming in, breaking out of a, you know, a route or stopping, doing a stop route and just keeping that position. Um, so again, uh, that would be the number one thing I look for is, and then I, I look a lot at the hips and make sure that their, uh, their hip extension is where it should be. Um, so they're not getting like low back hyperextension issues. Where uh, should hip extension be? Was that? Where should it be? So yeah, it should be at this. Where should it be? Um, again, that's relative to the position and relative to the athlete. I try. I mean, I, I almost nine times out of ten, they're almost at like zero, and I right. just try, I try to creep them into at least ten to fifteen degrees of extension without having a little bit of that pelvic tilt occur. Um, and it's. I mean, it's 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 a work in progress with every single one of them. Um, but again, I think if we can get ten degrees better. That's going to help them open up their stride, um, really mainly with the with the receivers and, and the backs. Um, that I think that can can improve upon. And then again, if they're if they're getting hit from behind or they get hit in a weird position, if they have a little more hip range of motion, you know, that's less of a chance of putting that that force into their lumbar spine and causing a you know stress fracture. Or there's a receiver for the Browns that had one of those recently, so um, trying to get that you know increase is is really one of our main goals there too. So they all come in with their own previous injuries and that's where I start and I focus around and then I kind of like bridge out from there. So this is, uh, this is, I need you to to take a step back and try to see this from a different lens. So you only get broken athletes for the most part. People don't go see you if they feel great for the most part, 99% of the time. That's true. That's true. If if you, if you were look working with athletes that weren't broken yet, right. What are, what are things you would do to be correcting those things? Gotcha. You know, if I'm looking at my athletes, what should I be doing on a daily basis so that we are I'm not, I don't need to send my guys to Chad Teague. Exactly. That's, that's awesome. So what I would do first is, um, something standard standardized. So you're not like guessing from one person to the next. That's the most efficient way, especially when you have assistants under you, you guys can all be on the same page and you not just like being the only person that knows every specific problem with every person, having a system like an FMS or I know I keep shouting them out, but um, some sort of movement screen that yeah. everyone knows and everyone has a very, very good grasp on. And then that's where I would start. And again, no pain, no issues. Then move them into some coordination stuff, stability, balance, see where their balance is at. And again, that's at the performance side. We're now taking the pain out of it. We're going more to the human performance side. So let's see where their coordination time is. Let's see where their reaction time is. You guys have all that technology to be able to do that, which is awesome. So start throwing that into into the into the mix and getting them, um, you know, accommodated to uh, to that. You know, one guy might have zero injuries, but his reaction time on one side is worse than the other. So that takes them again from being, you know whatever level they're at and taking them to the next level in, in their respective sport or their, you know, position. Um, you know, if they're, if they're a lineman and, you know, they're a right guard and, you know, maybe they have to switch to the left side at some point and their reaction time, they can't get the, they can't pass drop on that left side because they're, 
so used to that right side. So there's some imbalances there. There's weaknesses. Um, unilateral work is so huge and crucial that no one does enough of. Um, you know, we constantly are doing bilateral movements and we compensate so much that we don't see when you get someone in a single leg Bulgarian split and they can only do half the reps on the one side and, or they're like holding the dumbbells and they're, they're wobbling like crazy. It's like, boom, you, you don't even, you don't even know how weak your left side is compared to your right. And then you just find those little screens like that. Boom, right there. And it, and it makes a huge difference. There's so much variance in our athletes from a standpoint of just day to day. Like, you know, like there's just at, through a week training, you know, and so we do a global, we do a, we, we do, we do a general screen really tw twice a year. When, when we get back in January, we'll screen them to see if there is any specific things that came up from the season. Or when I first got here, it's the first thing I did is I screened every athlete through a, a general form of our screen. But what I talked to these guys about is we're screening these guys daily. As they walk in from their cars, we're watching the way that they walk. As we, you know, as we, every warm we do, we, we try to keep it multi planar as far as we're going to do something side to side. We're going to do something front and back. We're going to do some form of diagonal movement, whether it be a sprint, a lunge, but try to watch them in these different planes of movements. Is there anything particular that you think? I mean, obviously, you don't know what we currently do, but if, if you're talking about just a daily thing of watching an athlete, what specific things should we be watching for? Honestly, I think that's, you hit it right on the on the head um watching them walk from their car inside because that's when they're that's where you're really going to see like all right what's going on with that athlete today like why are they moving why is that why are they limping why and then that's the the obviously a, a far far right position but uh you know what are they doing that day specifically that's you know maybe they maybe you should focus a little bit more on mobility uh, maybe you should you know have them if they're really you know you know pulled out and uh something's going on like that's how you tell rather than when they come in and they're standing up straight and they know they're they don't want to miss they don't want to miss that lift that day because coach might get mad but you know if they're not moving well maybe they need to sit back and, and just go sit over and do you know a lot of lacrosse ball work and some um you know some foam rolling stuff and and to your guys's credit i i've never i've i work with you know quite a few strength strength and conditioning coaches um, in this area at least. And I talked to, you know, quite a few elsewhere. I, I still do not know someone that does as much as you, as you have done in the past with Akron and what you're doing with Buffalo, the, the attention to detail that you have with your athletes is, is above and beyond at all levels, NFL, um, college, high school, obviously, you know, there's not the greatest there, but, um, you know, you do all these little things that I think is above and beyond what other ones are doing. And that's what, you know, makes you so great at your position and keeps your athletes getting stronger and faster and, and being less injured. So. Well, thanks, Chad. I mean, a lot. A little shout out, but. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's, uh, we definitely can do that because of our organization and because of the work that these two put in to allow us to do those things. It's definitely difficult when you don't have good people working with you. That's for damn sure. Uh, you can lose sight of details a lot, but, um, you yeah, I mean, I think that's more on, you know, the mobility, a lot of the stuff that I do with my athletes, you guys are doing in prevention or post injury that, you know, I, that a lot of physicians will be doing in their, in their clinics on, you know, teaching and education on, you know, the cross ball work or foam rolling. Cause most people don't know how to do either of those. They just kind of hop on and just like wiggle around on them. But you guys have that, that structured in with your, with your athletes and, and a lot of that, you know, unilateral uh, work that you guys put in and uh, start stop the acceleration, deceleration stuff you guys work with. And, and you focus your program based around, uh, you know, the biomechanic stuff that I teach, which is, you know, really cool to see um, uh, from the strength conditioning side. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's structuring is definitely. I mean, you you can get uh, there's a lot of places in your program you can sneak this stuff in and it doesn't cost you a lot. You know, like it doesn't. You, you can sneak in you can sneak in VMO activation. You sneak in foam rolling to places. You sneak in a what we call an adductor plank and a psoas plank, psoas work, uh, post out stuff. I mean, you can you can sneak those things in throughout your program to where 
it, it, it's microdosing, and we do it constantly. And so by the end of an annual year, you look back and you see how many reps of VMO work we did, how many times that we we did a, a, a lacrosse ball release on a super spinatus. Like it's you know you yeah. you look at those things. Well, they, they add up over time, and I think chunking little little bits and pieces of it helped tremendously. And that you know, and that gets them to that point where, you know, hey, they're doing this one or two times a week with their super spinatus work or, or you know, infraspinatus po posterior cuff work with the cross ball. And then they're doing that and they know how to do it. So if their shoulder starts to hurt, they can then do it on their own, opposed to them just kind of not doing anything about it. And then those injuries just kind of slowly you know, creep up. Where are you at with that with with, with shoulder work? So I've this is a big thing that I I, I called I call I was just, I mean I was just calling to just get people's opinion, but I called like twenty five strength coaches around the country like three years ago, and I said, "Do you guys overhead press?" And yeah, uh, either yes or no, and I would just ask why, and I didn't get a whole lot of really good answers. And I just I, it was strictly like I knew where I lied on. I just wanted to know where where they were with it. Where are you with? with do you overhead press is overhead pressing necessary should we work more range of motion versus trap work versus where where do you think in an athlete's realm should we be loading overhead movements what do you think um especially in football i think again this is my opinion i think that overhead press is multiple things it's not just a barbell pressing up overhead um i think that it should be in 100% in your programming because uh, you never know what position in football you're going to be pressing from. You know, you could be pressing out, you could be pressing up, you could be pressing forward, you know. So having the ability and having that, you know, that range of motions, strength in that range of motion is, is huge. Um, so uh, whether it's, you know, it doesn't always have to be barbell if people don't have that range of motion to get into that front rack. You know, I, I very often put people in uh, a dumbbell position, and again, it's back to that unilateral work. You find out that one side's way, way weaker than the other. And again, that's more sport specific. They're typically going to be, you know, be in a position where a DN is going after a, uh, you know, a pass rush, and he's almost in an overhead press position as he's, you know, going towards the quarterback. So I think that's an extremely valuable um tool and 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 uh movement to be putting into the programming and then when guys and this is this is something when i first got here that was that? one of the tough what's that are you agreeing with that or was that your are you, do you yeah no i 100 percent agree we i mean we we we've had to progress it very slowly um but i mean like i'm a huge z press guy just because it's so much core involvement in that so mainly we'll work overhead squat we'll work z press um, I'm not against doing push press and push jerk. We're just not there yet. Um, and then a lot of, of, of half kneeling or kneeling unilateral work is kind of how we'll variate that is mine, with that. mine all day. Yeah. I, I wish we, I, I want to get, we're, we're hopefully getting our new weight room here within the next year or two. Um, but I want to landmine stuff is definitely stuff I want to get into. Um, and it's, yeah, you can do a lot of uh, great things there, but the, the thing that I mean, cause heist just got here about three months ago, heist now it's been three months. Um, Coach McNally has been here since I've been here. And one of the things that we saw, which was mind blowing, is I mean, guys could not get to that bicep on ear position uh, when we first got here. And it was, I'd say, I mean, what do you think, probably 70% of the guys? It was a very large proportion. Yeah. So that's my question then, too, is because, you know, obviously that's especially probably in some of those really tight high school athletes who are constantly texting and doing stuff like that. If a guy can't get into that position, is it just, in your opinion, is it just like range of motion and, and chin ups until they can get there? Or would you still load it even if they can't get into this position? I would load into the range of motion that they can, they can get to. Okay. I would force past it. Um, and that's again, maybe switching to a unilateral movement so they can get a little bit out of the, out of that direction and, and get a little closer to that, that bicep to ear. Um, I think that that's a, that's a, it is extremely important to incorporate mobility at the same time to open up those lats. Yeah. But if you open up those lats and then you don't stabilize and press afterwards, that range of motion is probably going to go back to where it was. That's one of my uh, or biggest key factors here is if you don't stabilize after you mobilize, you're going to lose what you just gained immediately. So not immediately, but it will go back to where it was. So anytime you do any T-spine range of motion, hip range of motion, 
Uh, anytime you're opening up a joint, you need to stabilize that, whether it's just a, uh, you know, a couple, if I stretch my lats and then do, you know, a light, lightweight press overhead for three sets of 10, that is activating that muscle and that's going to keep that range of motion longer. Obviously, if you increase 20 degrees in that one session, if you don't do any stabiliza stabilization after, it will go back. If you get that 20 degrees and then stabilize, you might only go back to 10. And then the next session, it just keeps creeping up, and then you work your way up till you get that free, that that full range of motion. Now, obviously, enough. there's some variance there as well. If someone might have a bony end end block, uh, you know, or you know something else, a previous injury, but still, again, trying to get as close as possible to that to that uh, streamline. So an example of like for shoulder, you would mobilize by maybe doing some like banded traction or something, and then you you'd work into some form of a press. Yeah. For football players, I would say my best lat stretch would be, it's the rig stretch. So it's basically you guys, it's, it's very easy for you. So, cause there's a million rig poles that you get on and it's a, it's hard to explain here, but it's basically I reach up overhead and then I take my back leg around behind and it's a, basically, I look like a bow and arrow and it really helps open up all of that lat fascia up here and then into that thoracolumbar fascia and basically hanging out there for a while. And I can show you guys later, but that, that is Again, the easiest, most effective for you because you can have 50 guys doing it at once. And um, it's one of the most effective stretches for, for lat that I found. Uh, and then you can immediately put them right into that press position. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe when – just because obviously they can't see this as well. But maybe when we're um, – sometime in the next week, if you can like maybe put together like your top five – and mm -hmm. just do like clips and send them to me and then I can just attach them to this interview so that people watching can just see like what your top five mobilizers or whatever are. I think that'd be awesome for people to see. I'll do it before uh, we... Dr. Ryan will help me. Dude, I, Dr. Ryan's biceps have been on your Instagram like six times. Show them. Boom. That's incredible. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. <laughs> um, no, the the only other question that I I for sure, and then I'll I'll, I'll let these guys ask because I know I'm sure they're they're getting some things back there as well. Um, but so create and then once again, this is something that the nice thing about for me when I was at Akron, I was there for seven years, so I could very slowly implement kind of my programming. Um, when I as we we've, we've been here, you know, we've dealt with some some knee pain when loading different squatting movements, whether that be a single leg squat, a Bulgarian squat, a back squat, a front squat, just, and it, it hasn't been rampant by any means, but probably, you know, two to four to guys that anytime we try to load them in that squatting pattern, whatever form or fashion it is, that load gives them, um, knee pain. So obviously my, my, my theory, or at least my philosophy is I always try to avoid that. So I'll raise the box. I'll, um, I'll, you know, I, they won't squat to that depth. How do we, or what is your philosophy on working around that then? So as we're, as we're trying to avoid that, how do we ingrain the movement pattern um, if the load is causing pain to work around that particular knee pain? Um, I think you, you're, you're doing a very good job with that. And, um, and, and going to that unilateral work if they do have that pain. Um, typically with a, we were just talking about this, when, when you load a knee and, it, and it's painful, and then you unload the knee and it's not painful, that's more than likely going to be a meniscus issue. Again, could be variance, and I'm not saying that that is the issue, but there's some sort of underlying issue with that meniscus. Um, if, could, uh, that, could, that, could that lead to, like, because a lot of the pain that they have, when they'll, it's, it's just patellar tendon stuff, Is then, that could that lead to that? Yes. Oh, no, 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 can patellar tendon issues lead to meniscus? Either or. Um, so, so, and then, then I was going to say is if, if you load it and it hurts and then you unload it and it still hurts again, this <clears throat> your generalization, you might have more of a patellar tracking or patellofemoral issue in the knee. So that's kind of like the differentiation we, we, you know, if I'm just like talking to someone and they ask me and I just, I just throw that out, it's, it's a pretty quick answer, but, um, obviously it could be variants in there. Because when if there's any patella issues, there could be um, you know plica behind that kneecap uh, or chondromalacia patella. It's called. It's just a condition where you build up of tissue behind the kneecap and it hurts. Um, and then patellar tracking, which you guys do an awesome job of throwing in your programming of really working that VMO. Um, because if I, I always explain the the patella as 
it's like a train and that and it's on the femoral condyle and it's like a train in the train track so if the lateral quad so if it's like this on here if the lateral quad is way tighter and the VMO is weaker, it's going to pull that patella out of the train tracks. And that's where you get that irritation and grinding that, yeah. you know, might lead to an inflammatory response to that knee. Um, so, so again, back to working around those issues, um, obviously there might be some, some treatment that might need to be done, but, um, my top things to do for knee pain with squatting voodoo band regularly every day, stress the uh, VMO, what you're doing, strengthening that up, and then releasing the lateral quad. How do you, what, what, is, what is your fair way of releasing the lateral quad? Um, it's like a... <laughs> I, personally I, I, I know a guy. <laughs> yeah. I know a guy who's got a really tight lateral quad. Yeah. So it, if, um, if you want him to be angry at you, this is a good way to do it because it's, he's going to be mad initially, but it really helps release that, that uh, lateral quad. Okay, that I can, um, um, I can do it. So it's so if you can imagine the um, IT band and the lateral quad, I'm not very good at making hand gestures with this, but they super you important. Watch out behind you, or, uh, Chad. What's that? You should have had a whiteboard behind you. you no, I'm throwing this hands. stuff out. Um, so I know is my background. I don't have the best background right now, but um, but that that lateral quad and the IT band are superimposed to each other. So a lot of times they get super stuck in that fascia. We talk, we talk about that slide glide. When they're not sliding and gliding, things above and below chain tend to get the reaction and the pain, along along, along with pain down the, the track of the IT band. But our goal is to release and break free that basically fascia in the muscle and let it have that slide glide, slide glide free, really movable. So um, lacrosse ball, um, I've actually I've, I've done lacrosse ball where you basically lay on your side, and I can show you this one too, um, and you kind of do like an inflection extension like yeah. I'm doing, like yeah. I'm doing RT on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. on that a PVC pipe works a lot better. Um, you just lay it down cause it's not moving. The lacrosse ball is hard to pinpoint it, yeah. but it's, it's not laying on the IT band. It's more along the lines of getting onto that lateral quad more. Um, cause the IT band, you're not going to stretch it. You know, that tons of research, nothing's going to happen with the IT band. Um, so get that lateral quad to move freely against the IT band. And that's the, that's where the magic happens. So, um, so I'll show you that, that video. And, and again, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a very uncomfortable feeling at first, but especially yeah, not, because I have a lot of weight. I stole that one from you. I want to say probably three or four years ago. And the crossball? Yeah. No, the one with, with the, the PVC pipes. And that's, that's like, again, that's one thing that with our, one of the biggest things I stole from you a couple of years ago, when we roll, that's what we, we won't foam roll will foam to find and then when we find a spot it's flexion extension yep. even if it's same thing if we're, if we're working post out stuff we'll we'll roll to find and we find a spot it's work through the range of motion and that's yes. one thing that i stole from you a couple of years ago of there's such a big difference when you just foam roll and just roll up and down versus when you foam roll and find and you stop yep. and then you flex i mean it's freaking game changer you know, obviously because you told me about it it's a freaking yeah. game changer yeah and, and, and that's, I honestly, I would say that's probably one of the biggest missing links and my side of work and strength and conditioning side of work is, you know, I, I don't see the, the response. Again, they've done research where foam rolling, if you, if you foam roll really fast, you're going to stimulate the Pacinian corpuscles, which is going to get you pre. And then if you foam roll really slow, you're going to hit the Ruffini corpuscles, which is going to shut down the muscles. I agree with that. I mean, that's good. But if you have specific spots that need to increase that range of motion or you have a trigger point, just sitting in there isn't going to do as much as if you pin that sucker down and then move it through range of motion and that breaks free that friction and those adhesions that are in, the, in, the, in those specific tissues. Yeah. You know, the other thing that and Coach Eisen and I have talked about is a bunch is that our guys, you know, the, the, the four guys that I'm thinking of that, that we can't get, but like, their knee pain is just kind of constantly coming back. You know, but it's, it's, we look at their running mechanics and their toe strikers, you know, so they just put that Patel in such a shitty position all the time. And I just, I think it's more so, and, and they're also, they're chronic knee pain guys. They've had knee pain their entire lives. Um, and then at the same time, I think just another point in, in the weight room, coaches will be like, Oh, well, it's definitely, it's definitely the movement or, Oh, it's, it's the squat that's hurting him. Like, no, why don't you look at his life? He's had yeah. knee pain since he was 12. 
watch the kid run. He reaches in front of him and strikes with his toe and jams his knee in front of his foot every time. Like, no shit, his patellar tendon is bugging him, and it's a little angry. Um, uh, and so that's where we have to, you have to understand sprint mechanics too, right? You can't just look at isolated movement in a weight room when they're in a non-dynamic situation. And that's why you guys are on the field and watching these things. Like, that's, that, that is, and that's back to your point on watching them walk in. It's a full circle, looking at everything that they're, they're doing. It might not, it's most likely not going to be in the weight room that's, that's causing the pain. A lot of times it can be, um, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of times, especially if it's an, is, an issue from when they're, you know, 12 years old and on, you know, it's going to be something that they're doing outside of the weight room typically, uh, like sprinting or their mechanics with how they play. Um, so, no, that's a, that, that is, that's very, very true. So, I, I like, I like you guys are, are looking at that, that full spectrum because instead of just saying like, hey, what is the need doing? Like, what, why does it hurt right now? You looking back to his past and finding out what might have caused it then or what you've done since then uh, that that's you know gonna that might be the solution that fixes his issue over just you know doing some tkes but again yeah. back to the tkes it's really good that you guys are implementing those things in because that's gonna that's gonna really take care of the, the mass population that has issues you guys are gonna kind of you know if you're if you're fixing 80 percent of those people with just throwing those things in and you're you're killing it so obviously keep doing that yeah, I know. I know. In your area, you've obviously you've had you, you've looked at or, or worked with some of the high school athletes, and obviously Scott and all those kind of things. Just some, and it doesn't need to be too specific. But what's just some general for people who are responsible for athletes, coaches, high school coaches, college coaches, NFL strength coaches. What is just a piece of advice that from from because because like I said, you see the broken people, mm -hmm. yep. looking at the broken people and the the the. The things that the commonalities you see of the breakings of these people. What is just some advice you would just say? Hey guys, here's some general things that we should be doing. So things that they should be doing. Just, just or, or just general advice. Anything you would, you general, would say. My biggest advice. I was so excited about this question because it's it's not it's strength coaches, it's athletic trainers, chiros, surgeons. Like my biggest advice for everyone is, and, and this is huge with the strength conditioning world too. Um, don't have an ego. Be open-minded and constantly be a student of life. Be a student the rest of your life. Constantly learn. You never know enough. You never know everything. So don't stop learning and don't act like you know everything. And it's my biggest pet peeve when you have other people come into a situation or and this is again experience from um, you know strength and conditioning coaches that I, I worked with in the past and I do now is like. When they have someone else come into the realm, like every it's just like a pissing contest, and you know, and and this is like, I, I you can you can probably attest to this in the strength conditioning world. Everyone everyone has the best of of they think their their version is the best, and this version is the best. And I think you do it best by you know you're you're constantly learning. You constantly text me and ask me, hey, what can I do here? What is this? You know, and and I don't know of anyone that's asking a chiropractor you know, what they can be doing for their, their strength conditioning athletes. So that's really cool in my opinion. Um, but it, it's just, just don't have an ego. That's my, my best and biggest advice. Um, yeah. that, I don't know if that's the answer. Or... Really good ones, honestly. Like there's, I've, I've, I've found a lot of really good ones that, that have surprised me as far as they're very open-minded and, and, uh, there, there's, there's some, there's some that obviously have a pretty bad ego, but it's been, I think it's getting better. I mean, you guys agree? You think, I think it's, yeah, I, I mean, you're going to come across coaches who, like he was saying, you know, my program's the best. But at the end of the day, it all works. So let's figure out what you're doing best, what I'm doing best, and let's put it together. I think it's getting better. I mean, I think and it's important that, that we, people like us, have these conversations and put them out there. And and it's funny because I think you're the – everyone that's been on the show since I've been in Buffalo, I think, has in some form or fashion said what you just said. Really? And so I, I think that's, that's obviously just naturally who I surround myself with because yeah. – I want, you know, you surround yourself with like-minded people, right? Um, but I think I think it's getting better. I mean, I really think that since the first time I got into it, I, I think it's getting better. So that excites me at least, you know? Yeah. And it's not just – and I wouldn't say just like like you working with another, like obviously football team or like you're working with another strength coach. It's, it's really across the board in strength conditioning and not just, you know, like I said, football. So 
you know, trainers and and then athletic yeah. trainers and, and any then, profession. Right? Yeah. I mean, shit. And, and even in a relationship, like how, how many people's marriages could be better if they were just more open minded to hearing what their partner had to say more often. Exactly. And and that we're talking life now. So <laughs> good advice right there. Okay, well, sorry, and uh, you guys can always jump in whenever, but I just always have a million different questions. So anything you guys have you specifically want to ask Chad? Uh, yeah, I can get rolling. <clears throat> so, uh, Chad, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier one of, the, one of the big issues you see is that lack of activation of the small foot with athletes and stuff like that. I uh, just want to get your thoughts on how much, in our setting, how much barefoot training or minimalist shoe type training do you think we should be doing? Just kind of curious about all that. That's a, uh, a great question. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily – I don't think you have to be barefoot to strengthen the small foot. Um, I think that's a misconception that people people say, you know, I can wear I can wear a, a Olympic lifting shoe and I can still activate my small foot. You know, it's it doesn't necessarily always I, if, if you learn how to activate it, you can activate it in any shoe. Um, I think obviously walking barefoot is a lot better because it increases your proprioception with your feet and your brain brain body connection. But um, obviously what I try to tell my players is, is get out of shoes when you're home, get into something you know, where you can walk around, feel the ground, um, you know, and I don't think they're, I, I wouldn't implement it into, I wouldn't be squatting with, with, uh, without shoes on. A lot of those guys already have, um, you know, biomechanical issues that don't allow them to get into the squat. So if they, you guys wear lifters when you squat? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We got, we, got, we, got, we got like 42 Nike, Nike, uh, Romelos. Yeah, I, I think I saw you post that, which is good. And, super, and, uh, super. Uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, so should I throw my house slippers, Chad? So you should throw them away. Should I throw them away and just walk around barefoot? You have a dog, so it's probably nice to not get your feet all hairy. Um, so you can keep your shoes on. You can keep your slippers on. Um, right, but no, I mean, I just just my opinion is learn how to activate the small foot and then do it in all your shoes, and then yeah. it becomes once you learn that, you start walking differently and you actually toe off on that that metatarsal head and, and it just it changes things so um you don't have to be barefoot to strengthen the small foot but that is a really good question because i think you know there's a huge debate with, should you wear barefoot shoes should you wear the little shoe sock things or whatever so um that's probably the one of the bigger debates right now is, is shoes versus no shoes but uh did, did that answer your question yeah, for sure. So really, it's just regardless of what's on your feet, it's just learn how to activate your small yes. foot. Yes. And, then, and while you're learning, you think you should? It's it's more advantageous to be barefoot. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah. My progressions is seated, single leg. Learn how to squeeze that one, and then seated, both feet, and then standing, single foot, and then standing, both feet. And then when you're cooking your eggs in the morning, just sit there and pump your feet. So, and honestly, I, I still do it. I mean, I'm. I'm teaching it every day, but I'll still sit there like I'm doing it right now and, uh, and just Get up. squeeze, squeeze that foot. Yeah. Uh, I just yeah. got cramped. So that means we I'm talked doing a bunch about the small foot. Can you put that when you do the YouTube, when you're, when you do the yeah. video clip, can you do, yeah. do the small foot one too? And I'll put, I'll just, I'll, I'll link that to this video. Yeah. Um, do that video small foot yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll throw them in and it'll be, might be Dr. Ryan and some of them, but be good to go. I mean, it's, I don't know about that. It's kind of distracting when his giant biceps are staring me in the face. <laughs> How am I supposed to focus on his feet? I know exactly. That's, that's so true. You should buy one a shirt just a little bit too small. <laughs> we'll cut him up. Put him in a long sleeve. <laughs> yeah, put him in a hoodie, please. <laughs> uh, uh, you got? Yeah, I, I had a quick question. So we we touched on this a little bit when we were talking about the overhead mobility and just kind of about like loading dysfunction. Um, cause like it doesn't happen, right? I mean, you were talking about the small foot, how many guys can activate it Well, they're loading that dysfunction every second of every day, you know, they're going to load dysfunction on the field because they have to go out there and play the sport. You know, how much, how much is too much dysfunction to load, even if there's no pain? I mean, at what point do you say that's, that's the limit and I need to go ahead and fix this before I continue down the road? You know, obviously if there is dysfunction, I'm working to fix that while I'm loading it, but a guy can single arm overhead press with crappy mobility and he's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, where's that line? Um, specifically talking with overhead press, this is a, this is a tricky, I, I'm more, um, conservative on, on the shoulder, 
uh, and a little, I'm a little, I'll let a little more go in the lower half of the body when we're squatting, because if we're getting in an overhead press and we're really loading it heavy, our shoulders aren't really built to take a lot of weight if we're getting into that internal rotation position. So if we're really dumping that shoulder forward, I'm probably going to pull them back because I don't want to rub that labrum too hard. Um, and again, everything, everything we talk about has their own situation and their own, you know, everything can be different in every situation, but the shoulder one's a big one. So if you're overhead pressing or overhead squatting and they're really dumping those shoulders forward and they're, they're really bringing that chest forward. Um, I would, I would probably pull them back a little bit, maybe get them on the wall and do some squat therapy, put their hands against the wall and let them try to squat in that position and, and rebuild that thoracic extension and then hit those lats to loosen them up before you, you get them into that position and maybe just, uh, you know, modify and, and create some other movement for them for those specific people that day. And that's, and that's gotta be your guys's eyes and, and kind of see, like, as soon as you see that shoulder really dumping forward, so, and not being able to keep that external rotation, um, that, that's where you, you probably, I would probably step in and, and, and pull them back a little bit. Um, cause how much are you guys loading? Like what, what percentage? We're not, are you? we're not loading much. Yeah. I mean, I think the heaviest we've gone is 135 and that's with like our top tier guys. We haven't that's a great position. Loaded over a lot much yet. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't, I think that most we've loaded anything over. Like I said, the first, the first four or five, six months was just literally trying to get them in that range of mo. I mean, we were, we were just hanging on a bar. You know, yeah. Hanging, just, yeah. just making sure on the bottom of the chin up, we were just getting to this position. Um, but I mean, for our, right now, our older guys are, 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 uh, our guys that are, are playing 30 plus snaps. Um, they're just PVC pipe overhead squatting, super setting in with their, yeah. with the, they'll, and, they'll do some cleans and they'll go bang out some overhead squats with PVC pipe. And put them, put them in the, like on a, take the J hooks out, put them in a rack and, lean them against that and let them squat against that. So it kind of keeps forces them back and then yeah. have that back and try to reproduce that. That's going to kind of, that's going to be more of a passive overhead squat because it's going to help them and then get them on the wall and have them try to do it with activation. So again, mobilize, stabilize. Same. And then back to what you said, um, you know, uh, about loading tissues, you know, this is again, um, very situational, but in my opinion, if, there's the static versus dynamic stretching. Um, if you're if you're loading someone in a squat and their hip mobility is ex is very very poor, um, and then you load them, if you just do a little dynamic warm up and their hips still aren't prepped enough, I think it's more crucial to do a little more static stretching in those hip in that hip capsule to allow them to sit back in that position more to load the spine in a better position than to um, just do a little dynamic and throw them in a bad position and force them through that improper mechanics. Does that make sense? Yeah. Where are you at with all the FRC stuff? Functional range conditioning. Um, I, I'm, I'm dabbling in it a little bit. I, I like it. Uh, I know it's, it's kind of, it's, it's hot right now. Everyone's not everyone, but a lot of people are getting into it. Um, I forget. There's a, there's a strength coach at, uh, one of the, I, th I think like, oh, what's his name? What school is he at? It's, but he does Texas, it with the entire team. Texas, Texas uh, Joey yeah. Burgles. So yep. He's actually coming from the show in a couple weeks. Yeah, he does it with the entire team. I, I, I'm interested in it. I, I'm doing a couple things right now. Um, I have dry kneeling coming up here soon, and I want to hit SFMA again with the rest of my team. Um, and but I, I'd be interested to to mess around with that a little bit. Again, I'm just trying to fill my toolbox with as many things as possible, and I think there's some really valuable tools that I could take from that. Again, I don't think it's the end all be all. Uh, and again, I don't think I worry that that would be difficult for you to implement because you guys only have so much time with the players. Um, and we, like we've said, uh, you, you know, your big thing, I always forget it, but I, I still use it. And, I, and when I try to explain it to people, I need to write it down this time. What is your, your checklist of things for the team? And if it's effective, it's effective. If it's effectiveness and efficiency. The two E's, um, efficiency and effectiveness. So if it's when we any any idea that we have or we talk about or when these guys bring something to the table, we say, is it more effective than what we currently do? If the answer is yes, then we'll move to the next one. Is it more efficient than what we currently do? And if the answer is no, then we don't change it. If it's yes and it passes the two E's, we change it that day. Boom. I love that. No, that that's uh, and that that's your your job with what you're doing. That's, I think that's a great, another, again, another, another life lesson there. So I'm going to definitely going to use that one in the future, but, um, 
but yeah, so I don't know how effective that would be in your realm. Um, maybe situational from guy to guy. If you have a guy, you know, with the uh, the trap issue before, you know, maybe that he did he ended up having a pinch nerve. Yeah, he hasn't played since that week. Yeah, so maybe some function range conditioning could be beneficial to him. Has he been what has he been doing? Going to Cairo? No, um, but we'll talk later. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. HIPAA. Kind yeah. Of. Yeah. Yep. HIPAA. All right. Well, um, obviously, I, we we could talk about the, all this stuff for hours, and and I always appreciate your time. Um, and anything else, anything else that ever comes up, or as you're learning new things, make sure you obviously keep me in the loop. Will do. Any last things, anybody? Same to you. Good talk. Thanks, Chad. Good seeing you guys again. All right, brother. Appreciate you, man.